Dave, I've got a rib tickler for you. <laughs> Oh my god! Uh, okay, go ahead. Uh, so I, I, I don't know why this popped into my head, but of course you know I worked for the I worked in newspapers for twenty years. Yes. And and for the last twelve, it was at the Philadelphia Daily News, and uh, which was and back in the day was a great paper. Uh, so I, I I used to hang out with the photographers because they were the most fun and they had the best stories, and we used to eat dinner together quite a bit. Also because you know all of us were working the the deadline graveyard shift and. And, you know, just bedraggled by by the time our uh, dinner break came. Uh, but I hung out with these Wait, old... technical question. Why would photographers be on the late shift? Wouldn't oh, they be on the they, early shift? The, well, they, you know, the, the, the candy-ass ones, yeah. But the ones that are out shooting sports and stuff like the that. The candy-ass ones. Brad, <laughs> the, the, from a previous life as a high school coach. <laughs> <laughs> Who uses the phrase candy ass candy aside from ass. people that are that are coaching football? Me and Coach Schmidtke. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you candy asses, let's pick it up out there. And a, like a rare shot of testosterone over here for some reason. That doesn't, <laughs> no, doesn't happen. I've, never, I've literally never heard you use yeah. the phrase candy ass. And honest to God, the last time I heard that was high school football. So that's amazing. <laughs> so I, I, and needless to say, I hung out with these old school uh, uh, photographers. Right. Uh, and these guys have been doing it for years and years and years, you know, back to the days of film and, and beyond. And and in the days of film, of course, you know, we got talking and before the internet, before even a modem, like like there was an interim period where they'd go to a pay phone and hook a modem up to the phone and, uh, you know, send the photos in that way. Uh, the old kind of modem where yeah. you have to put the phone on the yep. phone. Oh, yep, on the receiver. So, but, but even before that, I, I asked him, how did you get some of these late-breaking uh, sports events? Because all of the stadiums were down in South Philly. The paper was up in the middle of town. Uh, traffic would have been impossible. Mm-hmm. How did you get photos in from a late sports uh, event in time for the paper? Oh, yeah. You know, because it was it would have been impossible otherwise. And in the days before modems and all this other stuff. So going back, way back in the day... Uh, <laughs> this one photographer said, well, listen, we didn't have the internet, but we had pigeons. No, I they, s- no, no. And I said, no, are, they didn't say pigeons. Are you, are, are, do, what are you talking? He says, he says, there was one guy at the Daily News and his job was to cultivate and train pigeons. No. Homing, homing no. pigeons. I'm true, out on this story. This true, did not exist. True story. This goes all the way back to the Philadelphia Bulletin, which was a, pre, a precursor to the uh, to both of the papers. Klondike 555. <laughs> How old is this story? All right, keep going. But, oh, yeah, this goes way back. But they, they trained homing pigeons to fly between the stadiums and the uh, the Holy tower of crap. the uh, Inquirer Daily News building. And there was there was a photographer whose job it was was to cultivate, train, feed, nurture, take care of these homing pigeons, and they would strap a piece of like a, a canister a, a bit of film. Of film. Yeah. Do you remember the old films, right? The canisters. Yeah. They would strap a, a film to a. Wait, uh, wait, wait! Say that word again. I'm, I'm strap using, a what? Uh, the film. I'm using the Irish pronunciation. Oh, you're saying like an you. Irishman. Yes, okay, yes. right. Oh, or you strap the film. the film. All right. Yes. Like, Your like, man there would strap the film on the pigeons. That's right. right. I, I watched oh, Father. Oh. I watched Father Ted for five minutes, and now I'm <laughs> Irish. Uh, which, if you've never watched it, great series. Oh but, my God, Father Ted, feckin' great. So they strap. Feckin', by the way, I said feckin'. By the way, how funny is that that in Irish they have a word that is not fucking. It's feckin'. Feckin'. Yes. F e k. Like it's amazing that the like the linguistic evolutionary parallelism between feckin and fucking is amazing. Well, that's, that's great. It's not different than fricking, is it? No, but feckin' is an amazing word. Like <laughs> the fact that you'll get the uh, the good I- Irish men and women of good standing that will yes. use that word in public. That's amazing. Right. But keep but going. But won't use fucking. So they'd strap this canister to the leg of a pigeon and they would set it off and it would fly the distance to the to the tower. They oh would God. receive it, put it into the dark room and they would have photos in time for uh, in time for the for the late night deadline. And I said, how well did this work? And he said, oh, it worked. Oh, it worked so well almost every time. I said, almost. Oh, no. <laughs> and he said, well, there have been a couple of Pulitzer Prize winning photos that were intercepted by hawks. Oh, my God. Like every now and because also, remember, big cities with skyscrapers are wonderful habitats for falcons and hawks yeah, because they, they mimic and, yeah. those high cliffs. 
And he says, every now and again, one of the photos just never made it. <laughs> I love the idea that a hawk, I love the idea that a hawk would be swooping in from like the 105th floor in Philadelphia. And as the hawk is screaming downward, he's like, I hated your editorial yesterday. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> bring back Nancy. <laughs> <laughs> How dare you cancel Ziggy? <laughs> I didn't get Beetle Bailey. Brad, do you know the hardest part about training a pigeon to bring uh, uh, journalism photos from a stadium back to the Philadelphia Daily News? Not shitting all over it on the way? (laughs) Yes, that. (laughs) But also, there was a custom guy. There was one guy that had to train and raise the the pigeons. But then there was another guy that had to make and craft and fit the tiny fedoras with the little press (laughs) sign on the side. With the little press card. With the little press card up on the side. Yeah, that, uh, that was a that and buggy whips. You know, it was that was a niche niche kind of thing. Uh, that guy took his job very seriously. The, <laughs> the pigeon I love fedora that, man. In the days, I, you know, like jump back to 1920, 1930, like say the Capitol building in the in yeah. Washington D.C. Right. And I love that the day before there was barcodes or scanners or key cards or any of that, <laughs> you could literally just get into the Capitol just by putting a card into your fedora that said press. Yep. And people were like, oh, that guy's with the press. All right, there we go. Let, let, him in. In. let me. I mean, he's got a hat. <laughs> what do you mean? The other guy says, this is 1933. We've all got hats. <laughs> <laughs> the automobile hasn't gotten rid of the hat in American culture yet. Do you yeah. know, by the way, that that's why the hat went away? Because of the automobile? The automobile, the, the lowering roof line of autos <gasps> um, is what got rid of hats in American culture. And I that's didn't... why baseball caps are the one hat that survived, because you could wear it tight to your skull. Because it's just got that Anyway, rim. this has been Dave Kellett's Fun Facts. Uh, wow. So let's move on and say hello, everybody, and welcome to Comic Lab, the show ostensibly about pigeons and making <laughs> comics. <laughs> and making a living from comics. I'm Brad Geiger, editor of webcomics.com and the creator of Evil Inc. And I'm his friend Dave Kellett, cartoonist of Drive and Sheldon and co-director of Stripped. And this week's hour of comics advice is made possible by your support at patreon.com slash comic lab. So Dave, Dave! Let's talk comics. Let's talk comics, my friend. And uh, we want to give a huge shout out and a thanks to our pigeon loving friends over at Wacom <laughs> at WACOM.com. They're like, we do not like pigeons. Why are you bringing us into this? Uh, and uh, they have been kind sponsors of the show all year and uh, makers of the new Wacom One, which both Brad and I have, along with other Cintiqs in the studio. So it is a super appropriate and fitting uh, uh, sponsorship on uh, on their part. Absolutely. And we're thrilled to have them. Like I said, we but that, that Wacom One has been getting me through quarantine. Quarantine. I've been saying it now for seven months, and I'm afraid I'm going to be saying it for eight and maybe You notice nine. he doesn't say my friendship has been carrying him through this quarantine. <laughs> oh, 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 no. It's really just the walk of one that's been helping no. him. But now that you bring up our friendship, Dave, do you know that we actually got a question asking us uh, to talk about our friendship? Like they say— Oh, we did. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, if you're going to give me just a tailor-made transition like that, I'm going to jump at it. I'm Listen, I'm just like uh, the, the, the support staff on— uh, on uh, <laughs> Just serving them up here so that you could knock yeah, them home. That's great. Yeah. No, this one comes in from Daryl Manley, who says, Hey, Brad and Dave, I'll cut to the chase. What is the story behind your friendship? Everyone sure seemed to be the closest of pals on Webcomics Weekly, but the friendship displayed on this podcast seems even deeper, and I could only hope to have a cartoonist buddy I could be so close with. Uh, thank you for all the comics advice and entertainment. Dave, do you want to talk about our friendship? Yes, so this uh, this is a happy topic. This yeah. is a fun one to lead off on. So I had you asked me on the street, how long have you known Brad, Brad Geiger or Brian mm-hmm. Geiger? I was going to say Brian. That's oh, my, my younger friend, brother. Brian Geiger. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, As you can tell, we're very close. We're very close. Me and Mr. Gwigger. What's the, what's the last name? Gwigger? Gwigger? Me, me, me and What's-His-Face. What's-His-Face over there, yeah. Uh, so had, had you asked, I honestly thought that I had met you in 1999. Because oh, really? that was my first, I think that was my first San Diego Comic-Con. But Brad recently unearthed what can only be described as uh, the, the uh, oh, Derek, now I'm forgetting it. What was the, what was the stone that, that transcribed uh, um, Phoenician, Egyptian, and uh, I think it was Was Greek? it the Rosetta Stone? Rosetta Stone. The Rosetta Stone of our friendship. He yes. has recently discovered the Rosetta Stone of our friendship, which is an email that he sent me in 2001. So we yeah. met in 2001 at Comic-Con, not 1999. 
That had to have been, yeah, because it was June 24th of 2001, which is right after, it has to be right after Comic-Con, and uh, and we must have met and hung out there. I, here, I'll read, you, I'll read you the email. It says, okay. hey, Dave, I was reading your post to the Keen Spot mailing group. Remember oh, Keen so Spot? Just to flash everyone back, both Brad and I yeah. had recently joined Keen Spot in uh, late 2000, early 2001, I think. Mm-hmm. And uh, Keen Spot was and is, I think it's still oh, working it's still uh, going. as a collective of cartoonists that would kind of self um, uh, self promote one another. It was a, it mm-hmm. was basically a ring, right? Uh, uh, in terms of a, it was a very effective, very built upon a web ring, right? It, interestingly enough, what they what they uh, the way I parse it in my mind, what Keen Spot was, and this happens all the time with technology. They always try to bring the old world into the new world. So what Keenspot was actually trying to do was to be the equivalent of a newspaper syndicate right. or the internet. Right. So you would sign with them. They would, uh, in effect, publish your work because they owned the structure. They had their own proprietary uh, software right. to uh, put this stuff out. You used their software. Uh, they had all the connections for uh advertising which was huge because back then we couldn't figure it out for ourselves and remember google ads didn't exist Um, some of the nascent ad companies didn't exist yet so they had all the connections with the advertisers they would they would publish you they would put ads on your pages and then give you a cut and i believe it was like a 50 50 cut wasn't it It was pretty close yeah it was like how do you shave a penny and that was right it right. turns out you can you can split a penny in half. Anyway, yeah, the, the calendaring <laughs> feature I also remember was a big deal at the time oh, yeah. because uh, there really hadn't been any. You got to really flash back. There hadn't been any custom built stuff as mm-hmm. there is now for website design and hosting of comics. And right. so just having that was such a get. Anyway, all this to be said, Brad and I had just met online via this Keenspot messaging board. Right. Um, and so we had met and then met physically. Clearly, like July twenty first or twentieth of uh, two thousand one at Comic Con. Yeah, and I and so here, so the email says, "Hey, I was reading your post to the Keen Spot mailing gr- group, and I didn't see the name of the copyright lawyer you were talking about. Uh, a, a gentleman named St- Stuart Reese, who was doing a lot of uh, uh, legal Syndicated. writing at yep. that legal educating, especially for creators and cartoonists." Uh, would you mind passing along his name and contact information? I'd uh, be interested in talking to him. Uh, it was great meeting you, and thanks for selling a Greystone in book. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, so I, I cemented that first step of friendship by selling a book for you. That's with great. With commerce, yes. That's you right. C- you cemented the uh, friendship with commerce. It was, uh, and it, so we must have, you know, back, so back in the day in, in, uh, in San Diego, for Keen Spot, they had one, what was it, a, you know, one table. And uh, yeah, I think it was all... like a 20-foot wide booth, right? Exactly. Or maybe... Well, yeah. I don't even know if there, whether it was 12, maybe uh, it was 20. You know what? 20, it might have been 10. Yeah, it was Because it, I do remember small. there was like an oddly strict scheduling thing where you got like an hour. Right. And then you sat at your chair for that hour. So we must have been sitting next to each other during some period of time. Uh, or we, you know, one of us was just hanging out or whatever, and uh, you sold a Greystone in book, which well, uh, can it, I, can I tell you? And uh, Brad has also done this oh, many times over the years for me, so we might as well share it. My attitude was always a rising tide lifts all boats. Mm-hmm. So if someone had already completed their purchase of a Sheldon or a Drive book, to this day I will go. And if Brad is exhibiting next to me, I'll go. Have you tried Brad's work? Yeah. God, I can't recommend it enough. Fantastic cartoonist, and if you like Driver Sheldon, you'll love uh, you'll love Evil Inc. Right? And mm-hmm. Brad will do the same. Like when his purchase is over, he knows that his commerce has reached the maximum point with that person. So why not help out a fellow cartoonist yep. next to him? Right? And honestly, Brad, don't you think over the years we've we've done that quite effectively over uh, over time for hundreds of dollars worth of stuff that we've sold for each other, and, yeah, and also having exhibited next to Dave. I know what his typical fan looks like. So if Dave is heads down doing a, a sketch, and I see somebody coming by who's usually uh, a, a younger, t- a typically female, uh, she's got uh, you know she she's she's not like a cosplayer. She's just kind of a regular person, right? And just walking through. Uh, if I see that Dave's head is down, and if I catch their eye. 
I immediately pitch Sheldon before my own stuff because right. I know that's an instant hit. Right. Uh, you know what's funny about knowing the type of your reader? Uh, yeah. I think people will appreciate this. I, like Brad, I actually have come to spot what I would describe as a range of human beings that are readers of Sheldon, right? Yep. There was one time where a guy who must have weighed 300 pounds, all muscle, right? Yeah. Just a guy that has zero fat on him, but just like, he looks like the rock, built like the rock, leather jacket with cut off sleeves, a spike through his nose, a <laughs> mohawk, just riddled with tats, just ink everywhere, right? He's yeah. like, hey, I love Sheldon, man. Oh, man, this brings me so much joy. I love this guy so much. I was like, wow, you are not what I anticipated walking up right now. <laughs> oh, could you give me a sketch of the duck? Oh, that's awesome. And it's just like, he, he I was wasn't like, even wow. wear, He wasn't even wearing a, a homemade sweatshirt with puffy paint on it. Nothing at all. <laughs> <laughs> puffy paint. Puffy paint. So anyway, so Brad and I emailed, and what was my response email back to you? Do you have that? <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, 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 you basically very, uh, uh, very uh, uh, workmanlike. Uh, here's, here's his name and address. Great meeting you. Can't wait till next year. So Great very meeting much- you can- very much at arm's length. Yeah. I was cold from the start, yeah. I think. Much as we carry on now with our friendship. I was like, yes, business like business like, here's the information you requested. Pleasant to acknowledge your existence, and off I go. Right. Yep. That's I think yep. that's we can describe our friendship that way. I think. Yeah, it was it was not uh it was not a raging uh Im- immediate friendship. It was <laughs> Why are you laughing? Because <laughs> I, I can imagine, like, from that first meeting in 2001, I'm like, yeah, yeah, Brad's email. Oh, I want to meet this Chris Straub guy. Well, let's go. Long email response to Chris Straub. Oh, yeah. that's, that's hey, the stuff. Hey, Brad just wrote me an email. <laughs> <laughs> You know, that's 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 your icebreaker with Chris. Hey, hey guess what? So my email comes in. He sends me a workmanlike uh, response, and then he opens up a new page and says, Dear Chris, Brad Geiger just emailed me. Boy, he sure is odd. Don't you think he's odd? I'd like to talk about Brad for a little while because I think he's very odd. What do you think, Chris? Chris, are you familiar with the phrase odd duck? Because that Brad Geiger just emailed me, and I got to tell you, what an odd duck. <laughs> he's an odd duck. Let's talk about him for a while. Do you want to be friends? Have you ever smelled a human that smells like vinegar? Anyway, Brad Geiger he just emailed me. <laughs> Where do you think that comes from, that vinegar smell? How does he get that? Is that is that normal to northern Michigan with that smell? I don't know what that is. Is that something in the diet? A lot of, lot of sauerkraut? Lot of, I don't know what that is. <laughs> he just drinks wine and it spoils <laughs> through his veins? I don't so know. So anyway, to, to to build off this friendship. So there were, there were two or three years, Brad, where... It was an increasing level of helping one another, I would right. think, online, right? Like you mm-hmm. would answer a question, I would ask her a question. We'd we'd refer one another to points of reference or this or that, don't you think? Yeah, you referred me quite a while, <laughs> quite often to points of reference. Yeah, like <laughs> hey, Brad, here's the door. Don't let it hit you on the ass. <laughs> <laughs> Go jump in the lake. <laughs> there's there's <laughs> Here's a point of reference. Brad, you see that dock? I would yeah. like you to walk off that yeah. dock, okay? You know how that dock is twenty feet? I'd like you to take a twenty two feet walk. <laughs> <laughs> so uh no. In all seriousness though, we so we um there was probably three, four, five years, I don't know, uh, where we would share, and, and it became more of a joking friendship online in the way that you do uh, on message boards and emails and texts mm-hmm. and stuff like that. And then I think, uh, uh, go ahead, you were going to say So something. Blank Label Comics comes next in our oh, history, yeah. because then we, along with a, a bunch of other creators, had decided, you know what, Keen Spot isn't for us, but we weren't quite ready to go independent yet because there was a lot of stuff that was still difficult for one person to do. So you and me, Chris Straub, Paul Southworth, Howard Taylor, uh, uh, the Steve Deans, Troop, and, oh, yeah. uh, and Steve Troop. Yep. Am I missing anybody? Oh, no, Paul Taylor. Oh, Paul, Paul Taylor. Taylor of Wapsie Square. Yeah. So a bunch of us left Keen Spot all on the same day. You remember that? Yeah, I do remember that. <laughs> we all left Keen Spot on the same day and said, we're launching Blank Label Comics. Uh, Straub wrote a proprietary posting system on the spot practically. That's right. Yeah. Oh, man, and that I, was amazing. Chris Straub and I started a podcast called the Blank Label Comics Podcast. Yeah. and Which still to this song. day has a great song. and yes. a great theme song. <laughs> we got to find that somewhere. Uh, and then I think you were a, uh, you were a guest on that podcast because a lot of what it did was try to self promote our ourselves at first. Mm-hmm. And God, I was like, oh, this guy's delightful. This guy's got a great sense of humor. And um, and then from there, 
we uh, we uh, Chris mainly got hooked in with uh, Scott Kurtz, mm-hmm. who had Scott had been contracted with Image to or, or Scott had pitched Image on writing a how to make web comics book. He realized there was too much work for he to do alone, so he brought in Chris. Chris and Scott then realized that they had too much work to do alone, so they brought in you and I. And that was at Baltimore Comic Con. Yes. We were both at Baltimore Comic Con. Uh, the, the four of us were at Baltimore. In fact, and, were, were or, we sharing a room, you and I, I think? We or? might have been sharing a room with, probably with Chris. The only person who wasn't there in person was Scott. We brought him in on on the phone. Oh, that's right, on the phone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But we we brought uh, we, we went back to the room. There's the three of us sitting there. We've got Scott on the phone, and and he's like, hey, I got news. I'm, I'm doing a how-to book. And I instantly just bristled because I had been working on a how-to book. I'd, mm-hmm. I'd gotten like nothing more than the first chapter written. But I was, that was a plan that I had. And I'm like, oh, shit, this guy's going to beat me to it. And he goes, yeah, we, the deadline's coming up and, and, you know, we need some help. And we were <laughs> thinking you and uh, you guys would be good. And we sat and dev- and we came up with 12 chapters. Everybody had a that chapter. That night, by the way, I remember that one conversation. On the spot. We outlined that whole book within like an hour, hour and a half. Yep. And we said, everybody had one chapter that they desperately wanted to write. Right. It was like team ball. Everybody got to pick their favorite. Yeah. And then you eventually got stuck with, all right, who wants to take, you know, monetizing yep. a website? And I'm like, oh, I guess I'll do that one. Yep. It was like one that you wanted to write, one that you were kind of okay writing, and one that you had to write because you didn't have any more choices. Right. right. <laughs> you know? And then we decided how we were going to write it with everybody chiming in back and forth through the, uh, through the chapters, which was a great way to write that book. And then uh, I figured out how to, you know, how to set it up uh, technologically speaking so that we could see what each other was writing. And we and, and then around the same time, we were kind of getting like, OK, a blank label isn't really working for us. And so you, me and Chris and Scott jumped out and formed Half Pixel. Oh, right. Yeah. Wait, Scott wasn't in Half Pixel, was he? He was kind of like a, technically an advisor. Of half pixel, he yeah, was. He, he never like uh, 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 put his comic on half. Pixel and a lot or of this, like if that. you guys notice, a trend is a lot of this is increasingly smaller groups, mm-hmm. but still afraid to go solo. Don't you think, Brad? Wasn't that it? Yeah, yeah, that was exactly what it was. Well, and and the time wasn't right. Like 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 you said, there was a lot of this stuff that just didn't exist. Yeah, like Google ads and so on and so forth. Right, uh, RSS. It was it was getting to be a thing. It was getting to be easier. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. But there was so much of it that we just couldn't do. You had to have a few people working together. But as you rightly point out, smaller and smaller groups. <laughs> because what, what inevitably happened was, you know, we want I, I want to go this direction. Somebody else wants to go that direction. And you're kind of, you're always compromising and going in half measures. Yes. And don't you think, though, just as as is true with a lot with life, is that you slowly find your tribe. You mm-hmm. find the people you're like, oh, I really gel with them and I get them on an intuitive level. And even yep. if I disagree about details, in broad strokes, boy, they are in the same direction that I'm pointed. Yeah. In fact, Keith Knight said something last week that I really liked as a phrase. He said, mm-hmm. we circled the same star or whatever right. that phrase. I was right. like, oh, that's an interesting way to say that. I like that. But keep going. Yeah. I'm sorry. And it wasn't even that, you know, like I, we had disagreements. It was just that, it, you know, they, it wasn't, I, I had more ideas on exactly what I wanted to do. Right. And it was just at some point, inevitably, each of us just kind of split off and did our own thing. Yeah. But at this point in the story, we're forming Half Pixel. This is around the same time that uh, webcomics.com comes into being because that comes right after the how to make web comics book and that's also around the same time that we started the podcast web comics weekly is it not and we started that show just so everybody knows we started that podcast mainly to promote how to make web comics with image web uh, which was the book that that resulted from that conversation so and and i remember that period of boothing together for Mm -hmm. specifically at emerald city comic-con and Mm -hmm. also recording web comics weekly as just a laugh Olympics. We laughed yes. so much when we would booth together and people would sense it. They would come to the booth and be like, who are these guys? God, they're cracking each other up. Yeah. We were loud. We were having fun. We were selling a lot of books. It was great. It was, those it was, were good it years. was silly. And, 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 and we would do those. We started out doing web comics weekly to promote the book. And we just realized that we had so much fun doing it. Yeah. That we just 
kept doing it and kept doing it. And then I think we started out maybe Google Hangouts to record it, immediately jumped over to Skype, which yeah. was brand the tech, new. By the way, the, the nascent uh, uh, pro-am podcasting technology back oh. then was terrible. The, the if you worst. find if you find any of those old web comics weeklies, they're hilarious. But it's like listening through a tin can yep. as someone yells at you with a megaphone from four hundred feet away. They're just mm -hmm. they're terrible, you know. Including the laugh singularity that the one time that probably the the funniest thing I ever did uh, on a podcast, and it wasn't on purpose <laughs> <laughs> when when my my computer cut out and and it kind of fed back into a feedback loop that terrified Scott and Chris. Because your laugh was ha, da, 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 just laughing <laughs> as they a glitch. They couldn't make it stop. It, it was amazing. But so then we we're, we're doing Web Comics Weekly, and that it, it, so as we're doing Web Comics Weekly, we're all also becoming better cartoonists and finding our stride and doing our own thing and flying more solo. Don't you think? Yes. At this point, yeah. At this point, we've all got our own website. We stopped exhibiting as Half Pixel. Yep. In fact, I think Half Pixel stopped existing. I think you're right. I think you're um, right. And then we all kind of started to drift off and do our own thing. And I think it just became harder and harder to do that podcast to get all four of us together. That's exactly what happened. To the point of impossibility. Like, we never got four of us because together Because we again. each got really busy. And yeah. so now you couldn't, you, couldn't get the, you couldn't get all of us. And sometimes it was hard to get two of us, let alone three of us, who could be at the same time at the same place to do a podcast. Yeah, but getting a quorum was impossible. Yeah. So pretty soon, we, we really didn't want to give up, but the episodes started coming out more sporadically, more time mm -hmm. between them. And of course, we did a brilliant job calling it Web Comics Weekly because <laughs> then a bunch of bozos started making posts. Well, I guess it should be called Web Comics Not So Weekly. And it was, it was all of that we had to listen to. Uh, but 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 then we you know at so so now at this point you've got all of us uh, it, it, working our own individual businesses. Right. Web Comics Weekly has has kind of ground to a halt, and really and around that time I started working on Stripped, the documentary, right? Oh yeah, and that really took over my life. So I didn't see much of you guys for a couple of years there, where I was making that documentary. So for those that don't know, I did a documentary with Fred Schroeder called Stripped. And it took four years of my life because yeah. we did 300 hours of interviews all across North America. And um, I don't you think I kind of disappeared for the map for a little bit there while I made that film. That's just it. That's exactly what happened. I mean, other than that day that we were all uh, recording, the four of us, I think, was that at Scott's house? That was at Scott's house in Seattle. Yeah. So we were. Yeah. That, that, but that was that was it. We really didn't see each other uh, for a whole lot. I, like every now and again, it would be a, a, a nice email here and there. But it certainly we weren't calling each other at home or right. uh, having a, a an email chain or or a, or a message board thread uh, we we kind of fell uh and, and went our own ways for many years mm -hmm. at that yeah point. and there was there was probably Brad let's just be honest about it two or three years where I don't know that you and I said the word boo to each other that's <laughs> well, right I just said the word boo <laughs> <laughs> and you almost used the idiom correctly. That was very nice. <laughs> Brad, I, I think I came loaded for bear, Brad, yeah. uh, in you our were, friendship. You were absolutely loaded for bear, but you were no, pointing but in the wrong direction. To get to to get to get back to the point, though, even though, Brad, I knew him very well, and yeah. we had had many a deep conversation, and we had laughed a lot. Like, there's yes. so much laughter. There was like two or three years there where, I don't know, that I, I spoke to you. I'm no. being honest. I don't know that I, not for any malicious reason. We just sort of fell out of each other's life. Well, and we all had our hands full doing the things that we were trying to do. I, I, at this point, I've got two kids that are very small. Yeah, you and I became dads in the way that, like, when you're the working dad working from home, yep. also raising the kids, you a little bit like, all right, all my friendships got to go on fade for a little bit because I got to raise these kids. You yeah, know? yeah. But, oh, and, and during that time, I was getting up at six o'clock in the morning, getting the kids to school, going to the studio, working until. It's time to pick the kids up, getting them back at the house. I would see my wife for 10 minutes a day until it was time for me to get back to work at the Daily News, work until midnight, get home at one and go to bed and get up the next day to do the same thing. Yep. yep. So it, it, my days were jam packed with goodness. <laughs> yep. Yep. yep <laughs> so yep. as happens, you, you, you lose touch. So now, fast forward a couple of years, Stripped has come out. You're starting to get back. You're launching Drive. You're doing a few more projects. And uh, I had started a, a podcast with Scott Kurtz and his business manager, Corey Cassoni, called Surviving Creativity. Yeah. 
which was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed doing that. But then again, we got to this point where it was tough to get everybody to schedule a time to show up. Right. So we had, but but we never called it quits. We were just like, hey, you're gonna, you want to do this next week? Yes, next week is the week. We're gonna do this. And then next week would come by and it would be, it would fall apart. And then we'd yep. say, well, how about next week? We did that for two years, <laughs> during which all of a sudden now Dave. Uh, because we're intersecting, I'm sure, on social media, Dave starts, it. I don't know whether you, I, I've always wanted to ask you, hmm. did you have a timer set? A timer set? What do you mean? Every six months, and I mean every six months like clockwork, you'd send me this message that said, I really want to do a podcast with you. What do you think? We could have a lot of fun. And I would always say, we're going to do, we're going to get back on the horse with surviving creativity next week. I can't. That's funny. I do have reminders for some people uh, with certain things in my life. I don't think I did it for that. But once a year, I have a reminder on my phone that says, ask Bill Waterson to do a drive story. And every <laughs> every year I email him, hey, Bill, just check it in. See if you want to do a drive story. One of nope. These all days. right. There I go. I'll see myself out. Yeah. Um, so yeah, yeah. one of these days it's going to hit. Yeah, I'll catch him between paintings and yep. and I'll get him to do a drive story. But um, so, uh, no, I did not have uh, a thing. I'll, I will tell you from uh, uh, an outsider looking in, I listened to that podcast and every time it would stop updating, here's what I would do. I'd be like, all right, maybe now's the time to strike. <laughs> so, so do you remember how this next part happened? No. For, for you, we, you would send me messages, I'm telling you, for two years. And finally, uh, you sent me this message and you said, I really think we should do a podcast. You and me would have a lot of fun. We, we, we would have we would have a, a blast. And I said, you know what? God damn it. I've been waiting for two years for Surviving Creativity to start back up. By golly, we're going to do it. And th this was December, right? Mm -hmm. So we're going to do our first show in January. That's right. We said we'll start the year by doing a podcast. I yep. remember that. Middle of December, Scott and Corey get on the phone with me and they say, Geiger, we're recording. We're going to absolutely do it. And by God, they showed up. And now I'm recording two podcasts at the same time. <laughs> I'm doing I'm doing Evil Inc. I think I started Patreon at that point. I'm doing Comic Lab with you. And I'm doing Surviving Creativity with Scott and Chris. And I'm like, I don't have time for all this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then we, we got back. Uh, but Surviving Creativity uh, petered out after the next couple of weeks. We fell into the same old patterns. Yeah. But Comic Lab stuck around. And, and, and all of a sudden... You and I are doing this show like clockwork. In fact, has it always been Tuesday? We've always recorded, yeah, for folks that I don't know if they care or not, but we always no, but record Tuesday I, mornings. Here's my point. Here's my point. We did it like clockwork. We yeah. every Tuesday, I turn on this computer at 11:30 my time, look into the camera and there's Dave. Yep. And so we've handsome. Had, we've so I mean, let's all. let's not gloss over that. So handsome, and and with a and with a a, a quarantine haircut. That let me just say, <laughs> the third time is absolutely the charm. Third time is a charm. This yeah, was this you was did a well. pretty. I by the way, no one in my life is telling me, but the back of my head, I might look like a doofus that's been kicked by well, a horse. But I got you. the front, I'll the tell sides you. looking turn okay. Turn around, I'll tell you. I'll tell <laughs> no, you. No, no, I am not turning around. Turn around. All right, here Hold we on. go. I'll turn around. Oh, okay, that's not bad. Would you have the hiccups? <laughs> Meanwhile, I went and got my, because my wife said, I'm tired of you looking like a crazily homeless man. She, uh, uh, her uh, 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 salon, beauty shop, what, uh, the, the hair cutting yeah, people yeah. that are in the back of a comic shop. So, and it's a really nice guy that I've known for a couple of years who has a comic shop up in Maniunk, which is a uh, neighborhood of Philadelphia. Uh, so you walk through the comic shop and then in the back is the beauty shop. And so I went with my mask on. And uh, as she took my temperature at forehead, Dave, and then cut my hair. And so now I don't look like a homeless man anymore. Um, that's a level of bravery that I, I have not done any up close con human contact in the pandemic. Even like when she was going around the ear, I had to hold my mask with my finger to, yeah. to keep it close to my face. Yeah. But they, I got to tell you, they handled it really well. Yeah, were you wearing a cloth mask or an N95? Cloth mask. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. I, 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 well, you're braver than I am. I don't know. I, I suffer from a, not a small amount of anxiety in that in naturally. Mm-hmm. And so uh, I don't know that I would do well with that. Anyway, so back to the story. So then yes. we did this podcast and the last three years have just been a delight of doing this podcast. And I have noticed that I have, you and I have started calling each other up more for pitches, like in yep. year one of doing this podcast. We reach out for to one another for more advice. So it's really been a nice blossoming of an already 20, 19, 20 year friendship. Yeah. Into the last three years have been, I think, the most pleasant of them all. Yeah, because now we'll call and just talk about, you know, we'll either gossip or, you know, here, what do you think is going on? Oh my God, we are such the two little clucking hens when we start talking <sighs> about comics gossip. I know. <laughs> oh, I will never do it. But if we could let people just hear us cluck, 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 oh talking about God. comics gossip. Yeah, yeah, that would be you. You. <laughs> that's a whole nother side. <laughs> yeah, I just assume people continue to think I'm a nice guy. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, now and, and and now we we share writing uh, problems and stuff like that. And, and yeah. it's just it's been it's been this this whole podcast has been a really nice conduit for uh, for our friendship to really develop. I it think. really has. And, you know, they, there, there's that old kind of um, uh, saying that friendships are like seasons. And when mm-hmm. you get older in life, you realize that there are seasons. There's there's fallow seasons. There's growth seasons. Yep. There's. And we are in a nice blossoming season for this friendship. And it's been really, the last three years have been really pleasant yeah. as heck. Um, and dang, did we just talk for half an hour about our friendship? I think we, we did. did. We did. Oh, man, we have lost everybody. The only yeah. people listening to this, Brad, is, is your wife at this point. She's like smiling. <laughs> oh, this is nice. The boys are talking about their friendship. <laughs> yeah, she mentioned the, he mentioned the haircut. That was nice. <laughs> Hey, if you're listening while you work, take a minute to stand and stretch. And while you're doing that, we're going to tell you why you should join us on Patreon. When you do, you're going to get hours and hours of podcasts that we've recorded just for backers. And exclusive Patreon posts that go even deeper on Comic Lab topics. And access to our exclusive Discord server, which is a thriving community of professional cartoonists. So you can support the show you love and get tons of actionable resources for your own cartooning. And listen, if you can't swing a pledge this month, we get it. No worries. Yeah, yeah, listen, you can still support the show by rating us wherever you get your podcasts. Just leave a five-star review and a few kind words. That, along with mentions on social media, is incredibly helpful. Now, everybody, let's talk comics. All right, Brad, so we got our first question here coming in from Jay Lark over at patreon.com slash comic lab. And Jay writes, hey, D&B. <sighs> D&B, still not sure about that. d and I've, I've been surprised by the number of budding artists I've talked to who think that che- it's cheating to use references when drawing. Mm-hmm. I've heard objections to things including figure drawing classes, photo references, 3D models, and learning from the work of other artists. Will you take a moment to talk about what types of visual references you use? Is there anything you do artistically that in the past you would have considered cheating, but now you're confident is fair game? Mm-hmm. Thanks as always for your insight. Jay Lark or Lark, as he's uh, the, the, the nom de plume. Nom de plume for Mr. J. Well, uh, here's the you know, so the answer I think on this one is in the middle. Okay. Okay. Uh, so first off, photo reference and 3D reference and stuff like that I think is a really good idea. Okay. I, and and I so I heard figure drawing in that list. Figure drawing is I would not uh, di- dis- uh, dissuade anyone from taking figure drawing classes. Nor I. Uh, mainly because I have such fond memories of figure drawing classes when I was in college. Mainly because I went to a liberal arts college and none of them really understood. All they knew about figure drawing is that w- there was a nude model. And I used to torque them every time I'd get my sketchbook. They go, are you going to figure drawing? And I go, yeah. They go, what's today? I said, tracing. God damn. So Brad does this thing. I have to tell you guys on the camera. When he has a truly bad joke, he kind of sticks his tongue to the side of his mouth like a vaudevillian comedian, like like the tongue goes over. What's today in figure drawing? Tracing with the tongue. And you're like, what? Is this 1932? Are we in the cat skills? What's happening? All right. So oh, I've been uh, saving that one. But listen, so so here's the deal. I wouldn't dissuade anyone from uh, from figure drawing for sure. Uh, and and I use photo reference all the time. And I and and I'm telling you without a shadow of a doubt, once I've figured out how to use the 3D models in Clip Studio Paint, 
my work took a big jump to the next level. Without a doubt, it did. Mm. Uh, you know, it solves a lot of anatomy problems, uh, for one, and a lot of uh, proportional problems. Uh, there's a couple of things you've got to look out for, especially with forced perspective and, and, uh, and foreshortening issues. Uh, but in general, my work take a, took a huge leap. And I'll also say those mangaka that we're all so uh, jealous of, you know, they, they, when you go to Japan, you see they put up an entire phone book size manga. A new one a week, yeah. Yeah. Well, listen, there's a, re there's a way they're doing that. Corey uh, showed me one time. He says they, they put out books and books and books of photo reference for those right. folks to use. Even, even more than that, Brad, there's, there's entire volumes now of room references that where the room is already drawn yeah. in, in fixed style. And so you'll see a lot of mangaka groups like grab backgrounds, grab trees, grab clouds. You don't have to draw it now, you know. Yep. And that's and that's available an awful lot in, in Clip Studio as well. Mm -hmm. Now, here's the thing. Here, here's where I say the answer is in the middle. For a young cartoonist, for a young artist who's trying to draw, I wouldn't want them to jump to that too quickly. I'd right. want them to do uh, a, a, a lot of figure drawing, a lot of practice and stuff like that. Uh, and I wouldn't want, and, and I would also tell them to trace if the, if you're going to use photo reference and, and trace it, uh, I would tell them to learn how to trace like an artist, right? In other words, not trying to just find every line and do it, uh, uh slavishly, but to it, learn how to import your style into that image and use that just as not a template, but a guide and yeah. learn how to make your car using that photo instead of just tracing the photo because here let's face it dave when you just trace a photo and put it into your comic it sticks out like a sore thumb right it's um uh, brad hit it on on the head there where um the style has to ultimately be yours yeah i don't think any reader's eye minds when there is something that is slightly better drawn than the other thing and provided it matches and fits the, the style and tone and look of your comic mm -hmm. if you suddenly have this jarring thing where like in, I, like, I can't do it because it's visual, but if I did it with, like, accents, if your entire comic looks like this, oh, hello, I'm a comic, yes, very nice to see you, and then all of a sudden you have a photo reference that sounds like this, hey, y'all, what y'all doing over here? Hey, I'm having a lot of fun. People are like, wait, what the hell is that thing? Why is that fit? That doesn't fit in this comic. What is, yeah. what is that thing over there, you know? And so um, I, like you, um, use photo reference, and I take both from photos that I've taken mm -hmm. and from found, found objects of like deep Google searches and that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, but the, the trick has been, for me, when I do it well, it's I take the best aspects of that photo into my drawing, make it my own, spit it back out as my own. Right. So it's not like, here is a trace of a bicycle. Here is a trace of a 1985 Ford yeah. Taurus, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. And, and, and let's face it, I, it, it, there's very few of us that can draw bicycles really, really well without photo reference. That, that it just is same with horses. Yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, that, 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 and, and yes, you could sit there and, Work out all the angles and 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 just beat that one to the ground. But but if that 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 bicycle drawing is going to take you four times as long as it's going to take you to do your comic, you're not doing yourself any favors, no. right? Unless you're no. going to be a bicycle artist and you're going to do nothing but bicycles, then you better learn how to draw one. But otherwise, what are you doing to yourself? Yeah, and so there's a lot of competing things here. Like Brad, I would say for younger cartoonists, really focus on trying to draw it yourself mm -hmm. first. Because it's like a version of of my dad's advice for doing home repair is try it yourself first so that yes. you know how much how it's worth to you to pay someone else to do it. Right. And that's kind of the same with photo reference in your art. Try to draw it yourself so that you know how much you can carefully bring into your own drawing as photo reference so that it doesn't look like it's standoutish. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Know how your hand would naturally draw it, how your eye would naturally draw it, so that when you do eventually start to use photo reference, you go like, no, I wouldn't be that clean or that right. wouldn't look that perfect. You know, right. it would... I would cheat the, the roof line or I would change the bike tire or I would do this or that, you know? And so um, I would, like Brad, I would recommend it. But where I would also say is that so much of comics is the art of the possible. And what mm -hmm. you're trying to do is on a fairly regular schedule, produce a lot of pages, right? Yeah. And so I don't think it's cheating in terms of like, if, if it fits the mood and tone and style of the comic, and most importantly, if it communicates what you want it to communicate, it doesn't matter if the first iteration sketch came off of a photo reference. Mm -hmm. 
if the final version is ultimately yours and fits within the world of the comics and communicates what you wanted to communicate, don't you think, Brad? Like, yeah. A lot of that is utilitarian. Like, did it did it achieve the goal of communicating that there is a bike in the background? Great. Then it right. did its job. You then know, that you kind of thing. You did your job. Yeah. Right. And, and if it fits, it fits. I was tell, I was talking about Scott Kurtz a couple of weeks ago here on the show. And I said, you know, I, I introduced him to these clip studio backgrounds. And he was drawing a schoolhouse, uh, the interior of the schoolroom. And I was telling you, he could turn it at any angle, put that camera anywhere. But it, and it was a it was a Japanese schoolroom. When he got done drawing it, it didn't look anything like a Japanese schoolroom because those desks became American desks. You know, there's right. a difference in, in the approach. Uh, but he he was using that perspective. He was using a lot of those lines for guidance. But what he ended up drawing and what would the guy and the 3D reference were two completely different things. And that's what I I guess that's what I mean when I say, you know, learn how to cheat like an artist. Right. <laughs> you know, right. it, it, using that, if you want to think about it as a cheat, that's that's fine. It's it, I don't think it really is. But you've got to make it your own. Can I let's build off that very specific example. So. Um, if I was Scott and I was using the same kind of 3D image of a, of a schoolroom, right? But mm -hmm. I was making it an American desk instead of a Japanese desk. Yeah. Um, and, you know, there's differences if you look at photos. Sure. Um, here's what that saves me. I could, Brad, draw a desk, right? Yeah. But what I would have to do probably to do it well from certain camera angles is I would have to draw a volumetric cube yep. and figure out the cross angles. And I would have to figure out, well, what's the plane for the desk surface and what's the plane of the chair and how do those differ in terms of 3D angles, right? Mm -hmm. I could do it. I Honestly, I could do it. You could do it. Any one of us could do it. Well, yeah. But uh, what I'm getting at, though, is though is time. Time becomes an right. issue there. Right. So bringing in that 3D desk of a Japanese desk, even though I'm going to redraw it, it mm -hmm. saves me like 40 mental steps and physical steps of having to figure out the physics of chair planar surfaces in that 3D space. And now try to do 30 desks lined up. In, in a different, room, slightly different angles, yeah. In perspective. Now, of course, like, like the, the go-to cheat on that, and it's again, it's not a cheat, is to do it in isometric uh, perspective where mm -hmm. it doesn't actually go back in space. All the lines are either uh, horizontal, vertical, or like 45 degrees. Right. Right. So you can do an isometric perspective, which is a little bit easier, but of course, it's isometric perspective. <laughs> it doesn't look very natural. No. And it's also um, in one of those model classrooms, like the 3D thing, is mm -hmm. that you could do it with an isometric. But what ends up happening is everything looks like army soldiers march backing in, marching backwards in space. And like it's just a smaller version of the one that was in front of it. Whereas everybody knows that in a classroom of 30 kids, there's the one kid that just picked up his backpack. And so his desk is turned five degrees to the left. And then the other kid was talking to his buddy. So his desk is turned four degrees in the other direction. What I'm getting at is all the imperfections that really make a drawing pop and uh, it, it just takes forever to do. And so that's those moments are when photo real photo reference can help you uh, get to a desired end without taking hours and hours of figuring out the, the, um, the time. Yep. But one thing, Brad, that I wanted to mention in terms of photo reference, and this is maybe very specific for folks that are writing and drawing fantasy or sci-fi, mm -hmm. which is to use your own phone to take uh, distinctively angled photos of common everyday objects that you can turn into a castle, into yeah. a spaceship, into a ray gun, into whatever you need for your story, you know, a uniquely shaped sword or something. Yep. Uh, because it is unexpected, mm -hmm. it is very much taking an artist's angle on an actual photo referenced object, but reinterpreting it into a very different thing. And I'll tell you a fun one. I think I might have mentioned it on the show once in the past, Brad. But I needed a, a gigantic spaceship for Drive, my sci-fi story. And so I happened to be vacuuming the floor, and we have a Dyson vacuum, which has all these weird heads that you can attach onto the, mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. front of the Dyson. And um, one of the heads, I was like, this could actually be a pretty cool spaceship. <laughs> you know, obviously reinterpreted through my drawing style. So I took like three, four, five photos of it from different angles mm -hmm. so that you could have it flying overhead, swooping down in a, in a bank shot, that kind of thing. Yeah. And I reinterpreted that photo reference, the basic lines of it, the outline, the shape of it, mm -hmm. but then reinterpreted it into a spaceship. And it came out looking really cool. Yeah. 
And so if you're doing fantasy stories, if you're doing um, sword and sorcery, if you're doing sci-fi, sometimes a, a photo-referenced everyday object recontextualized into your style as a very different object in your story mm -hmm. can be a fun way to use photo reference. So yeah. I would highly recommend that. Yeah, and you see like Erica Moen doing that, uh, doing photo reference all the time. If you follow her on social media, yes. she's constantly posing for her own comic and so forth and having friends take her photo so she can use that just to set up the illustration the final yeah. illustration doesn't look like a traced photograph of erica it's 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 her style it's her uh uh line art uh but she she uses that an awful lot i i think there's a lot of stigma to this because i think we uh, assume that you're just supposed to be able to lay a t-square out on the drawing board and 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 whip out this amazing illustration and listen there's people who can do that and and i i'm jealous of them uh, but I just know realistically, I'm not one of them. You know? Right. And and lest you think that that uh, well, only modern cartoonists are doing this. Um, uh, Tintin, or as I like to say it with a French accent, Brad. Tonton. Tonton. Yes. Um, Tonton. Uh, there's a lot of there's a, there's a book that came out. I don't know if it's available in the U.S., but it's available in France and in Belgium and in Europe that shows all his exact photo reference that he used. Yeah. Because, you know, unlike Google Photos now, there were only a limited number of uh, photo encyclopedias of, say, military hardware or or Jeeps or this kind of thing. And so people went back because he's got such a huge fan base. They went back and they found the actual photos of the Jeep that he used in the background here, of the submarine that he used over here. And some of them are pretty much traced. So yeah. it's not like it's not like Tonton didn't do it too. Like right. did it get the job done? Yes. Did he make it into his own style? Yes. Did it did it get the page done that he needed to get done so he could keep telling the story? Yes. yes. The point being Greats have done it too. It happens. It exists. I don't know that there's any any shame of it, unless, as Brad says, the artifice comes through in a way that doesn't look good on the story. Right. You know what I mean? Right. And and again, if you're if you're young and you're just starting out, yeah, you want to practice your drawing. You don't want to go straight to the tracing paper. <laughs> you no. know, give yourself some time to develop and grow. Uh, but uh, in other words, it, it shouldn't be the end point. It should be a tool. That you use. That's a great. That's a great summary. We really yeah. should say because the end point is running it through the artistry that is your mind and your right. hand. Yeah. The 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 tracing, the photo reference, if it's tracing, but if it, even if it's photo reference, the point of that is to get you started, is to get right. you down the right path. It's not to get you to your destination. Your art will get you to your destination. Yeah. Your interpretation of that object will get you to your destination. But uh, like to Brad's point, it's uh, it's great as an artist to start off by building your own skills and then rolling that in as one tool among many in your toolkit. Absolutely. So, Dave, I've got a question I'd like to have your thoughts on. This one comes in uh, to us from our five dollar Patreon backers, and it says, hey, B&D, what advice can you give to someone who wants to work on more than one project at a time? You each do it and do it quite well, but the only advice I can find out there is this. Don't. <laughs> <laughs> so, That's funny. So the best advice he's gotten so far is don't in terms of multiple projects. Dave, what do you have to add to that? Well, let's. there's two ways I think you can build a career. One is to do one thing really well. So that first you get good, then you get fast, then you get good and fast at mm -hmm. that one thing, right? That's been the path that I've taken. Mm -hmm. And then once you get good on that so that it's almost second nature to do that thing, that mm -hmm. project, then you branch off into other projects, right? That's one way to build a career. Another way to build a career is to do passingly good at a bunch of things at once. And the thought there is that the skill sets from one will bleed into the other and they'll all sort of inform one another and you'll get progressively better and better at those four or five different projects. Yeah. I personally, as is evidenced by the fact that I did the first, mm -hmm. I would lean towards doing one, get really good at that yeah. or at least get passably good at that and then start to, to dive into other things. Um, now, if they all use the same skill set, say cartooning, mm -hmm. um, should you do more than one project? I don't know. I think I would still argue if you're early in your career, do one. Get good at that. Make sure you feel good about that, about where the story is, where the characters are, where it's all going, how it's all holding together. And then maybe five years in, maybe seven years in, maybe then start to dip a toe. Brad, what are your thoughts? I'd like to hear what you have to say. Uh, listen, here's the deal. You've got the rest of your life to be an artist. 
Okay, you don't have well, to. Why are you looking at me? I, well, you always do this where you address it to me. Oh. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just talking about basic actuarial tables, Dave. Uh, no, <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm, Dave, I'm, you got about 20 years yeah. left tops. No, I'm, I'm being completely serious. You got the rest of your life uh, ahead of you to be an artist. You don't have to do all of it this week. OK, You're, yeah, just I, it's because here's why I'm going to tell you, you got good advice from whoever told you don't. All right. You got you were getting good advice. And I know you came here so we would contradict it. but We're not going to. Uh, the answer is don't because you should, like Dave said, pay attention to doing one thing and get really good at that and then decide to either pause that or try to uh, juggle two things at once. But you're not going to be ready to do two things at once for a long time because it's not as simple as just drawing two comics. Now you've got to draw and maintain two comics on uh, perhaps two different websites or two different uh, uh, paths on your existing website. Now you've got to do time management. How many times do we get the question about time management on this show, Dave? That's mm -hmm, from people mm -hmm. trying to do one comic. Now right. you've got to do time management for two comics. And if you can handle all of that, good luck, because you haven't even started doing social media and crowdfunding for those two comics you're trying to do. Now you're diluting your, uh, your, your outreach in terms of social media and doing crowdfunding can be very, very diff difficult when you're trying to do two different things. Like Dave can tell you, trying to uh, keep up with two different Patreon accounts for two different things. Scott has the same problem. We mentioned him a lot this uh, this show. He must be on our mind. But Scott does a separate Patreon for PvP and one for Table Titans. He can tell you it's really, really difficult. Now, it's not just doing the two comics. It's doing all of the orbiting things around those right. two comics, and right. you are going to crumble. Right. I want to say, I want to circle back around on the thing that Brad said, and I, I took a joking attitude about it, but yeah. I shouldn't have. He said, you have your whole life to be an yeah. artist. And I want to focus in on that because I think there's a lot of truth to that. And I want to explain it in this way, is that there's a phrase that often gets uh, applied in a gendered way, uh, in an mm -hmm. unfortunate way, which is that, can you have it all? It's that question of, can you have it all? Can you have kids right. and a job and a family and a productive, creative life and all this sort of thing? And um, both men and women of, of all stripes mm -hmm. uh, face that question of, can you have it all in your career? And I think you can, but you have to pace it out over your life. You just can't do it all at once. Yeah. You, if, if you're going to have kids, you just got to know those first two years, you're not producing as much as you could have otherwise. Right. And that's okay because they will eventually come a time when they're teenagers where they don't want to hang out with you. They want to go play video games or go down to the mall right. and you've got plenty of time to draw again. So yes. you'll, get, you'll get it all. Mm -hmm. You'll just get it over the course of your life. And so that's kind of the way I think about art is that, Brad, right now, inside of you and I, both of us, I know that we have a fiction prose story mm -hmm. in our hearts mm -hmm. that we would love to write. We just don't have the time for it. Right. I know we have a hobby that you and I would love to do like i would like to take up spanish classical guitar i never have the time to take it up right but uh i would love to do it at some point in my life uh gardening i would love to do more of it lately and i, I don't have as much time as i would like to give to it i'm sure there's a thousand things that you would like to do with other projects mm -hmm. um but part of it is coming to realize that you have probably 50 productive years as an artist you mm -hmm. can get a lot done of those 50 years you just can't do them all at once right and so even though both brad and i do a lot of projects right now uh we do comic lab we do evil link we do standalone comics we do uh not suitable for work comics for patreon mm -hmm. we do drive we do sheldon we do uh other things we do that because it took a decade or so for us to get one of them down so right. that that could not on autopilot, but it's it's uh, it's like an old friend that you know how to talk to. You know, you, I know how to do Sheldon. Brad knows how to do Evil Link. It's not um, it's not uh, climbing up a mountain every day. It's like jogging up a hill, you know, yeah. and so um, so we can do multiple projects, but only because we've put in a decade or more of work into that. And so we know what that world is. We know what that entails. We know. Right. Um, all the shortcuts that we can safely get away with in that project too. Yeah, um, that doesn't mean that you can't. Uh, it, that doesn't mean that you can't uh, have these other things in your head. It doesn't mean that it, it, you're doing the one thing and you. Oh, I got this other idea for another project I want to do. Well, mm -hmm. take an hour. Uh, uh, you know, exercise that demon. Get it out on paper. Uh, do some sketches. Do some writing. Write down some ideas, uh, and then go back to your main thing. 
And then later on, you you can continue to develop this. You can get, mm-hmm. and b- besides, think about this other. T- take another way of thinking about this. What's the one mistake that we that we keep pointing out on this show for three years now? We keep coming back to what you don't take enough time writing. You don't take enough time to write it. You don't take enough time to craft it. You certainly aren't taking enough time to edit it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, you're not taking. If you're doing humor, you're not taking enough time to push it to where it's actually really funny instead of just settling for something that just made you laugh. Right. Uh, there's so much problems in just the writing phase. You don't go far enough with the writing. Well, you've got a wonderful situation here. You can work on this comic that you are doing and do all kinds of great things with it and 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 work on doing word balloons right and composition and all that stuff that you do time and time again when you do strip after strip after page after page, whatever you're doing. Now, every now and again, you go back to that piece you've written and that that outline you've written or mm-hmm. maybe those ideas you've jotted down. And now you've got a little time to polish them because you're not going to make those into comics yet. You're going to hold right. off on that. And right. now you can just concentrate every now and again, when you need to scratch that itch, you go back and concentrate just on the writing of that. A few years down the road, when you are ready to take on a second project, that writing is going to be good and polished. And now you're going to hit the heights with it because not only will that writing be good, but you'll be a different cartoonist three years from now and you'll be able to maximize it. You've got a wonderful opportunity here. Don't, waste it by trying to do two things at once and doing them poorly do the one thing and put that other thing on a slow burner to not to ignore it but just to work on it slowly in the background until you are ready to do two things at once boy that is a great bit of advice Uh, i've done that in my own career and so i will wholeheartedly co-sign brad once again brad is smarter than i am (laughs) And and says it better than I am, and with a better smile, a warmer smile, a gentler smile, <laughs> a warmer like, and gentler smile, absolutely. Like smaller, small animals running up to see, uh, like in almost Bambi well, that, style. That happens in Philadelphia quite a lot, but we set traps for them. <laughs> <laughs> So, all right, Brad, I'm going to jump us into our next question. Uh, this comes in from uh, Jay, uh, who uh, writes over at patreon.com slash comic lab. I recently had a couple unexpected follows on Instagram from much more successful cartoonists than myself. And prior to that, I've had the occasional post get liked by higher profile artists that aren't followers. I could never figure out an appropriate way to say, I see you over there, widely published artist, <laughs> but not get creepy about it. So two questions, if I may. What is the best way to recognize a big follow or an unexpected high-profile like of your art? And two, mostly referring to the random likes, how do I avoid the rabbit hole of overanalyzing how they even found my work to begin with? So Brad, you're you're fishing in a pond, and suddenly you've hooked this gigantic 32-inch bass. Yeah. And you're like, what? What do I? What? How do I get this again? What do I do? Okay. So first of all, what's the what's the best way, if any way, to recognize a big follow or an, or an unexpected high-profile like? Let's tackle that one first. Man, I gotta tell you, my advice would be to play it cool, and 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 I don't know that I would do a whole lot of outreach because listen. A follow is one thing and a, 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 a favorite or, you know, a little heart symbol or whatever. That's that's one thing. Uh, but it, it's still not that other person actually wanting to make contact with you. Might just be uh, you know, they're looking for different things to you know fill their feed with. And uh, and, and yours caught their eye one time. They hit the favorite button a couple of times. I don't know that I would do any type of outreach until that person either a overtly made a comment. Now you've got an open door to say, right. Hey, thank you very much. I've been following your work for a long time. You're great. Blah, blah. Or B uh, the, the favorites are coming so routinely that it's like every time you post something, they favorite it. Every time you post it, they favorite. Yeah. Yeah. yeah now yeah. you've got a little bit of an open door to, uh, I, I don't know that I would do it in a direct message or not. I, I would have to play that by ear, but you could you could s- send out a little bit of a message saying, hey, I just want to say I really uh, appreciate your encouragement. Uh, I'm, I'm a big fan, blah, blah, blah. Uh, the main thing you want to do is not overplay your hand. You don't want to get pushy. You don't want to get creepy. 
uh, you don't want to you don't want to put this person in a in an awkward spot. And that's why I say, from everything that Jay has talked about so far, I don't find anything that is particularly noteworthy. A follow is very nice, but it's just a follow. A favorite is very nice, but it's just a favor, uh, a favorite. I don't know that that we're in the zone where we're starting to trade uh, email addresses just yet. What do you <laughs> what, what do you think, Dave? I, am I am I am I holding back too much, Brad? You you immediately have to go uh, invite Neil Gaiman to your birthday party. That's what you got to do. Uh, so no, what uh, I I'm going to come down a little bit even stronger than this, mm-hmm. which I think I don't think any of this warrants necessarily reaching out in yeah. any way, other than maybe if they're truly huge. The reason why Neil Gaiman jumped into my mind is because there was one time where he retweeted one of my comics, right? Yeah, and I was like, wow, that's neat. That went out to a bunch of, of really interesting uh, folks that I never would have been able to reach otherwise. But then what do I do with that? Like, right. I, like I'm putting myself in Neil Gaiman's f- in feet, right. uh, shoes. Sorry, not feet. Putting him into um, his feet? <laughs> yeah. He doesn't know me, nor does right. he want to know me, no. nor does he want to follow up on it. He liked a comic. He right. retweeted a comic. Yes. He doesn't want to, he frankly gets enough weirdos and kooks all day long. Yes. He doesn't want one more from an artist who he retweeted. So all I can do would be, I, I think I retweeted a, hey, neat, at his retweet kind yeah. of a thing, you know, to, to everyone else. But um. I put myself in my own shoes. When Brad, mm-hmm. if someone were to reach, if you like a comic, yeah. are you trying to strike up a friendship? No. Are you are you actively <laughs> looking for someone new in your life, Brad? No. Are you no. are you auditioning for friends? Uh, so no. Like, it, it, what I'm doing is one of the four C's. I'm curating, and and and, and basically, sometimes it's no more than that. I see something; it happens to be the right time at the right moment. I haven't posted anything in a while. This looks good. It's something that I I think. Oh yeah, my readers would like that. I hit. You know, retweet, favorite, boom, gone, and it's la- and it might be the last time I think of it. Right now, if I'm if I'm retweeting this person a lot, that's that's saying something. It's saying, hey, I think your work is really good. Then that that might be opening a little bit of a door. But one retweet or one favorite, nah, it's got to it's got to be more consistent than that. Right. Really, what we're talking about is. Uh anyone is looking for validation in their art, right? And in this moment, someone who you admire on some level has validated you, Mm -hmm. either with a like, with a follow, with a retweet, with a share, whatever it is, right? Mm -hmm. And so a little bit, don't you think you're chasing the dragon of like, oh, I got a hit of that drug. I want more of that. I know that sweet, sweet validation. Yeah. And you can't force that. There's nothing you can do to force that. It happened once. It might've been a fluke of the weirdest algorithms in the world brought their comic to, to, or your comic to their eyes. How do you, how did it get there? Who knows? Will it ever happen again? Probably not. Mm -hmm. They saw it. It caught them at the right mood at the right time. They retweeted it because they're also just human beings enjoying art sometimes too. And that's it. And yet you're looking at it like, oh, Marie from third grade. She noticed me and I want to, I want to hold the hands or whatever it is, you know, I noticed me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so like you're, it's, it's not unlike dating in that you're, you're, (laughs) you're desperately trying to find, uh, you know, something, anything, (laughs) someone to date you (laughs) anyway. No, but, um, but, but here's, here's the thing. So, so, so this, this large scale Instagram person follows you. Chances are they follow a lot of people and they don't yeah. want to be friends with each one of them. Maybe they favorited a couple things. Uh, if that person, so here's what you're thinking. Oh, maybe this high level person likes what I do. Maybe they uh, want to promote me. Maybe they want to bring me in on a project. Maybe they want to pay my mortgage next month. God only knows what different things are going through your mind, right? Right. Let me tell you. If that person wants to do any of those things, they know how to get in touch with you. They do it. Yeah, they know how to do it. They're not you dumb. You, need, you don't need to say, oh, by the way, uh, Mr. Gaiman, you can pay my mortgage next month. You don't right. need Because he knows that that offer is on the table. <laughs> <laughs> and if he wants to do that, he'll get in touch with you. That's how social media works. They can get in touch with you. Honestly, I think a lot of people times fame or the perception of fame um, uh changes how we think someone should act but ultimately it still comes down to golden rule kind of stuff of treat other people the way you would want to be treated and if if you retweet a comic yourself that doesn't mean you're actively looking to to get 
a new best buddy or anything. It just means right. you like the comic. Yeah. And if, if in this case, Neil Gaiman liked the comic, so be it. He liked the comic that he's a human being. Just let it be that. That's okay. It was a lovely moment. Yep. It's okay to just let it be that, you know? Yeah. And so the next time you meet uh, Paul Rudd at an Avengers premiere and you just want to tell him that, <laughs> oh, he sells every joke that he gets in the script, even, even lines that aren't jokes, Brad. You're like, I see you, Paul Rudd. I see what you're able to do with even moderately written lines yeah. and you sell it. Yeah. But you're trying not to be a creepy and so what you do is you just end up fumfering at the avengers premiere yeah. and not even really saying anything you want to say and, and that's okay that happens in life brad but you hate to throw away that packet of swiss miss chocolate uh mix that you <laughs> keep in your glove compartment with his name on it just in case just in case just in because case. there is a you know it's a not a not impossible chance that he might be in your honda uh, odyssey minivan someday and might want swiss miss and he probably and so likes marshmallows there's nothing creepy about that, no. Brad. There's nothing creepy nothing, about that. Everyone would admit. Nothing at all creepy about that. Uh, but now, do you have any thoughts? The second part of his question was, how do you avoid going down the rabbit hole of how did he find or she find my work in the first place? Oh, okay. Well, first of all, I think let yourself have five minutes of trying to figure it out. It's mm -hmm. fun. That's okay. There's nothing creepy about that. Right. Don't get stalkery, but it's fun <laughs> yeah. to try to figure out where the retweets yeah. were. Go ahead and do that. Then keep it to yourself. Yeah, uh, again, yeah, keep it to yourself. Uh, so much of this is don't be a creep and yeah. don't be weird to the person and don't be weird to the world. Yeah. Uh, and it's, again, it's so much of it is going back to what you learn in kindergarten or golden rule kind of stuff is that it doesn't matter if they're famous. They're still a human being. And I guarantee you they are um, actively harassed by a billion people online. Don't be one of them, you yeah. know? Es especially when you get up to those high numbers uh, on social media, which, yeah. you know, <laughs> Dave, I, I, don't, I don't have to worry about that for quite a while, but uh, but uh, but like the people that are in the 100,000 uh, range on social media, you got to imagine they're getting an awful lot of messages incoming uh, that to the extent that probably they're not even looking at all of them. Uh, oh, no. To be fair. In fact, Brad, you and I have met at Patreon some social media stars who have hired people to do that for them. Yep. So even if you were to reach out to them, you're going to you're going to reach Becky, uh, Susan's uh, social media manager. You're mm -hmm. not going to actually meet Susan. You're going to be talking to Becky, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So don't, you know, Dave has the right call there. Give yourself that moment of enjoyment. Ah, this is, this is nice to have somebody uh, give me a little validation. And thank them. There's nothing wrong with thanking them. Oh, yeah. I, I, oh, yeah. All of the polite social, uh, frankly, you treat it just the same as if somebody with seven Twitter followers uh, uh, gave you some acknowledgement. You give them a nice polite thank you. you right. Know? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for the kind words. And and again, it goes back to Brad's four C's of social media. Kindness yeah. really is a guiding light for so much of this. Just, uh, because kindness will tell you don't be a creep. Kindness will tell you don't be overreacting in terms of, or overreaching rather, yeah. in your reaction to them. Yeah. Kindness will tell you just to be thankful, grateful, and move on. And that's and that's okay. And here's another thing kindness will tell you. Kindness will tell you that you've been listening to Comic Lab, the show about making comics and making a living from comics. Your hosts have been my friend, Mr. Smidgens, the kind <laughs> pigeon that carries the photos. A smidgens from... the pigeon. By the way, did the, did the pigeons get a byline? Wouldn't it be funny if it was like, you oh, know, Hank, Hank Biggums, the photographer, and Mr. Smidgens, yeah. who was also an assist. Get a little photo credit underneath there. <laughs> a tiny little photo of Mr. Smidgens. Oh. Mr. Smidgens, the great tail pigeons. <laughs> All right. Your hosts have been my friend Brad Geiger, the editor of webcomics.com and the creator of Evil Inc. at evil comic.com. And my friend Dave Kellett, co director of Stripped and the cartoonist of Sheldon at sheldoncomics.com and drive at drivecomic.com. And the Comic Lab theme song is used with permission from the ever-delightful Andy Creighton at theworldrecord.net. And this episode was edited by Matt Woodard of Woodsong Productions over at www.woodsong.media. If you love Comic Lab, <laughs> if you love Comic Lab, you can rate and review the show on Apple Podcasts, and you may hear your review featured on a future episode. Dave, you know, speaking of kind words, we asked a few uh, months or a few weeks ago, whether uh, what our listeners did if it wasn't comics. In other words, we said, oh, right. we know that we've got a lot of cartoonists listen to us, but we've got people from other work walks of life who don't necessarily do comics at all, uh, and they like the show. We've heard from some more of them. You want to hear some of this? I would love to, yeah. This one comes in from Heather Button, who said, you probably referenced my tweet about architecture. I'm an architect, fiction writer, and poet. Now, before you even ask, Dave, she answers. Weird, but they intersect. 
As an architect, I design buildings, but I also create graphic standards for clients. My thesis was on mental health architecture, and your mental health podcast won me over. As a poet, I look at graphics online because I post my poetry uh, on Instagram. And let's face it, you need some graphics to get noticed or just the right font. True. As a fiction writer, I'm editing a novel to be published on, on an architect who designs supervillain layers. I like That's it. fun. And I, I had thought about the graphic novel medium, but it's not my strength. So just let's say I appreciate everything about Comic Lab. I jokingly say that my tagline is, I create worlds, literally and metaphorically. That's awesome. That is really fun. Thank you, Heather. Well, I actually have another one here, Brad, from James Sutter. And James writes in, hey, Dave and Brad, I just wanted to chime in with my data point for your listener career poll. While I've done a little comics writing professionally, most of my work is writing tabletop role-playing games, video games, and novels. I find a lot of your creative and entrepreneurial advice applicable to my other fields, but the main reason I listen is for the camaraderie. Your show captures the fun of being after hours at a convention, hanging out with other creators. I always leave cons excited to get back to work, and the same is true for Comic Lab. Thanks for the weekly dose of inspiration. That's delightful. Wow. Okay, one more, and then we'll uh, wrap up the show, because I can't I can't pass this up. Listen to this. Okay. I'm a PhD student in chemical engineering. And I enjoy listening to Comic Lab while I analyze data. A Chegg, Brad. You know the chemical <laughs> engineers are called Cheggs? I did not know they were called Cheggs. I roomed with a chemical engineer when I went to Notre Dame, and uh, I love that they call them Cheggs because it sounds like um, Chegg always added like one of those creature uh, societies from under the earth, like yeah. Mole Man and his Cheggs. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. <laughs> You'll never get me in Northern, nor will your Cheggs. <laughs> The technical comic stuff you talk about is not relevant to my life, but as a reader of web comics, I enjoy hearing how the sausage is made. I also don't really use the stuff about monetizing one's creative work. The stuff that's really useful to me in your podcast is the stuff about how to get productive work done outside of a structured corporate job and the stuff about taking care of one's mental health. It is through your podcast that I've come to realize that science is very much a creative field. Which, by the way, that's wonderful to hear. Yeah. Thank you for that. Also, the show is fun to listen to. You are both delightful talkers, and you clearly have such chemistry with each other. It feels like, and and by the way, uh, uh, this person would know because they're a PhD in chemistry. (laughs) Oh, I was wondering. I was waiting for you to jump in on that. I see what you did there. I see. How did I not see that? Yeah. It was literally right in front of me. It feels like sitting quietly near a couple of good friends having a conversation about a topic they love. Please oh my keep God, it that going. Is, yeah. That is the exact that is the exact replicable uh, statement that I would like to uh, folks to think about Comic Lab. Yeah. It's two friends talking about a topic that they love and sharing their best practices as best they can. Yeah. That really is like my own mental uh, guidepost for what this show should be. It really is. It's like an unofficial tagline. So thank you so much. That came in from chemistry PhD student Rosalie Berg. And Rosalie, uh, best of luck with the PhD. Those yeah. are those are tricky years. Uh, so Brad and I wish you the best on those. That, You'll make that's it. exciting. You'll make and it. I will say the Comic Lab is made possible by your support on patreon.com slash comic lab. So we'll go ahead and say that like Mr. Smidgens. I don't know. That is a pigeon, right? That, that is, pigeon yes, they coo. <laughs> <laughs> well, see, here's the thing. Living in Los Angeles, I don't have the same pigeon per capita that you have in Philly. Oh, you, really? I know that you have more f- pigeons in your oh, life than I do. Tons of, I could probably open up my window and see a pigeon on my air conditioner unit right now. Now, here's what I have that you don't have because the pandemic has uh, shown this to be super clear in my life. So... In 1961, there was a fire in Southern California, and all these Brazilian parrots got out of a (gasps) private collection. Really? And then, in the late 60s, early 70s, Bush Gardens closed in Van Nuys, California, and more Brazilian parrots of a different kind got out, right? Southern California is kind of an amenable environment for parrots. Mm Mm-hmm. Now we have a fucking ton of Brazilian parrots that fly overhead. You'll get a flock of like 100 Brazilian parrots flying overhead, and they're loud, right? Yeah. And only in the pandemic, now that it's super quiet, I'm like, my God, there are parrots everywhere in Southern California. Do they land in your yard and stuff? They definitely poop in your yard, oh, yes. I bet. But when Brad, when you get a flock of like 100, 200 parrots, there's a very distinctive cry that you don't get from other birds that you get from South American yeah. parrots. 
And it's quite impressive, a sound, when you see them flying overhead. It's great. They've got, and you've got no place to take those parrots. They're just, they're just there. They're staying there. Well, uh, okay, let me ask you. Let's say you're the Humane Society or, or a birding society. Yeah. How, what are you going to do? How are you going to catch 500, exactly, 600 I, I'll parrots tell you flying exactly, around? I tell you exactly what I do with them. I make a phone call to, to Pittsburgh is what I do. I make a phone call to Pittsburgh, and I tell them to send over some of those pirates, and the parrots go on the pirates, and oh, then for God's send sake, them that's right the back, joke you were going with. Right I'm angry at this. I am angry at this. I did not see that joke coming up Broad Street. I get some pirates, and the, pirates, the, per- the parrots, the parrots land on the immediately shoulder, come down to earth, and then you send them right back to Pittsburgh. Ah, you'll be coming with me, Mister Smidgens. <laughs> Can I tell you as a friend, the the, uh, the thing that I think of when I think of Brad Geiger, and uh, don't get me wrong, uh, I feel like no one works harder in comics than I do, but the exception to that is Brad Geiger will outwork me in any situation, <laughs> in any scenario, and he will do it with a smile and a laugh. I have incredible amounts of joy with comics. Somehow I feel like when I look at you, I'm like, how's that guy having more fun than I am and getting more done? <laughs> Like you work harder, you laugh more, you you live a good life when it comes to comics. You have a life well lived. So you know the funny. I'm 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 totally not making this up. So uh, we uh, that was my answer for you. Oh really? That was my answer for you. Was somebody who is filled with joy and kindness and can out hustle anybody, including me. Oh well, and to I be consider, fair, I I consider I said myself Brad could- a hustler. I, to be fair, though, I just want to make this comparison clear. I said you can absolutely out-hustle me. I didn't necessarily say kindness. 